Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for our NCAR Explorer series lecture called How Emerging Technologies Can Enable Us to Create an Inclusive Future with Dr. Niha Cheruglu. My name is Dr. Lorena Medina Luna, and I am an education designer and lead organizer for the NCAR Explorer series. NCAR, or the National Center for Atmospheric Research, is a world-leading organization dedicated to understanding Earth system science, including our atmosphere, weather, climate, the sun, and the importance of all these systems to our society. And I'm really glad to be with you all today. Um, for this lecture, we will take questions at the end, but please feel free to submit any questions that you might have during the talk using the Slido platform. If you scroll down the web page, you can see the Slido window just below where you're seeing the live stream video of this event. So if you haven't already, go ahead and click on the green join event button. Then you can ask questions on the Q&A tab and answer the poll question on um, the polls tab, both of which are found on that blue bar across the top. And be sure to join Slido to add your thoughts to our word cloud question. What do you think of when you hear emerging technologies? Because we're going to get to that soon. This lecture will be recorded and will be available on the NCAR Explorer series website. And today we have NCAR scientist Dr. Nihant Cheruguru from NCAR's Computational Information Systems Laboratory. Dr. Cheruguru is a project scientist and the lead and the head of the Visualization Services and Research Group at CISL, um, which is the Computational Information Systems Laboratory at NCAR. And as an interdisciplinary applied researcher, his, focus, his research focuses on the application of emerging technologies in the design of inclusive experiences to communicate scientific findings to domain experts, to policymakers, and the general public. He has designed and developed multiple visualization interactives, which have been featured at the USA Science and Engineering Festival in Washington, DC, the White House Frontiers Conference, and on Capitol Hill. Dr. Cherukuru received his PhD in mechanical engineering from Arizona State University, Tempe, specializing in Doppler LIDARs and XR data visualizations. And Nihan, I invite you to um, turn on your camera and say hello to our guest today. Thanks, Lorena. Hi, everyone. Um, and now, uh, since we had some time to ha uh, have guests fill out our word cloud, um, Paul or Brett, would you be able to share the Slido um, for the word cloud for us, please? Thank you. Um, so what do you think of when you hear emerging technologies? Think of AI, machine learning, new technologies in the experimental phase, cloud applications, innovation, virtual reality, meta, and most recent AI technologies. Um, you're definitely welcome to continue adding to this word cloud. Um, but with that, uh, Nihant, I can pass it over to you and I'll come back on at the end to, to help with the questions, but definitely welcome. And I look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you all. Thank you, Lorena. And first of all, like many thanks to the organizers of NCLAR Explorer series, especially Lorena, Olia, Dan, as well as Brett and Paul. Uh, I know you folks will be working in the background making this happen. So your work is much appreciated. And thank you all for like filling out the word cloud. And I especially like the answer where like there was a catch all answer that said about everything about anything that's new and emerging. And uh, I must say like that that's like the most accurate answer. And uh, again, like almost everything that you have mentioned is basically correct. So going into the talk, uh, basically emerging technologies, if you look at the definition, they are like these new and fast growing technologies. And some of the examples are like augmented reality, although like you, you are, we are beginning to see augmented reality more and more these days, although like they're, practical applications are still like yet to be seen. It's like a work in progress. And then you have autonomous vehicles, internet of things, and uh, all these technologies club together. And the focus of this particular talk would be uh, 
how these emerging technologies have helped us really discover some fascinating applications in the field of data visualization, science, and as well as like their applications to accessibility and bringing all these things together. So to begin with, let's look at data visualizations and like that's the that, that's basically where I started when I explored. A little bit about my background. Uh, now I am an interdisciplinary applied researcher. And like when I started off doing this work, like I had no clue that, uh, you know, I'll be working on all these different technologies. So like my first introduction to interdisciplinary research came in during my graduate work when like I worked in the environmental remote sensing group of uh, Arizona State University. So in, in that group, like my work specialized with Doppler LIDARs and uh, <clears throat> some of the applications of Doppler LIDARs using computer vision as well as data visualizations. Now, uh, like a quick introduction to LIDARs. Um, so a LIDAR is the machine that you see over here, like in the bottom right image. So it, it's basically a machine that shoots laser pulses into the atmosphere. And it basically looks at the reflected light from like dust and other aerosols that are present in the atmosphere. And by looking at the reflections from it, it's able to create, paint a picture of its surroundings um, and we can measure things like wind speed. And this is fascinating because prior to Doppler LIDARs, we only had like point measurements and like sparse measurements. Now with these instruments, you could paint a much richer picture. And uh, that's probably like one of the reasons that, that got me into data visualizations too, because like, now we have access to data that can be like visualized in high resolution. And yeah, another reason that got me interested in my work is the field projects that we get to do. So the one in the top right is like us uh, using the LIDAR to make some measurements at a wind farm. And the one at the bottom is just study like how the dust disperses when a helicopter lands in a desert. Now, uh, so the first emerging technology like or the main emerging technology that I'll talk about is augmented reality. And my introduction to augmented reality happened through one of these field projects that I was involved with. So the photograph that you see on the top right corner is of the Meteor Crater in Arizona. So Meteor Crater is an impact crater that happened around 60,000 years ago when an iron meteorite like hit that area, fell on that area. And then atmospheric scientists were uh, interested in studying the wind patterns that were happening inside and around the crater because they had many similarities with downslope wind storms, basically the wind storms that happen near mountainous regions, such as the ones that uh, people might be familiar with in the Boulder area. And in that experiment, uh, as, uh, like as my job was, like I was taking care of the LIDARs, I was working with LIDARs. And uh, the good thing about LIDARs is that, uh, now with LIDARs, we were able to actually observe the phenomenon that was happening, as uh, you can see in the image in the lower right corner, where you have a traditional data visualization, where you have this rich data set being shown in 2D. Now, one thing that, uh, I, that really bugged me was that uh, when you look at this rich data set that is available, now this is a physical phenomenon that's happening around the crater. Like you can sort of feel it, you know it's happening by looking at it in the computer screen, but then you couldn't really see it in person because I mean, as wind is invisible. And uh, while I was exploring for how to get this thing into the real world, that's when I got introduced to augmented reality. So for folks who are not familiar with augmented reality, so AR is an environment that allows you to place virtual objects in, in your real world. So let's take a look at the image on the lower right, uh, on, the, on the left, sorry. So, so that's a screenshot from a very popular game that came out in 2016 called Pokemon Go, in which you have these animated character uh, that's, that's basically present, that's overlaid in the camera feed of the real world. So that, that's one example of augmented reality. Now, the way uh, like I implemented this with data visualizations was like, in, now imagine instead of that animated character, you replace that with the actual measurements that you're taking on the spot. And that's the video that you see on the right, wherein um, uh, I have a like uh, an iPad-based augmented reality application that we developed in which we take the measurements from the LiDAR and instead of viewing it on a computer screen, it is displayed at the location where it's happening. 
that way a making it more intuitive as well as like putting things in perspective now um, i'll go a little bit into the implementation of how uh, we did it so at the core uh, you can think of any augmented reality application to have like three layers and um, for the sake of simplicity i'm, I'm just looking at uh, phone and iPad based augmented reality, basically video based augmented reality. So in that you would have the first layer, which is basically the camera feed, the live camera feed. And now the goal is to place a virtual object on the top of it, like the sensor data. And for the augmented reality to work, as the camera or, or as the phone moves in the real world, we need to adjust the virtual object such that it gives an illusion that that object is fixed in the real world. And the way we do that is by uh, taking input from the phone's sensors. So, so basically for us to make that adjustment, like we really need two pieces of information. Like the first thing, like as the image is moving, we need to understand like how the phone is moving in the three dimensions. Like, is it moving front, back, left, right, up and down? As well as we also need the orientation information. So in addition to how it's moving in that direction, we have to figure out how the phone is tilted and which way the image is being pointed. Now we can get these information from the inertial measurement you minute. Uh, so that's basically a suite of sensors uh, where like you have the accelerometer, which measures the acceleration, a gyroscope, uh, which can basically tell how the phone is tilting and the magnetometer, uh, which is essentially a compass. So we can put these, uh, we can take the information from these sensors together and uh, we use this data to adjust the virtual background, giving uh, it an impression that uh, like this virtual object is fixed in space. So this is a very simple implementation of AR and like this was implemented around like eight years ago and before like we had this fancy like technology available. And uh, there's just one problem with this implementation. So when you take the measurement from uh, sensors like the GPS, GPS is only accurate up to like 10 meters, which will work if you are driving and you just need to find where you are in a map. But for applications like augmented reality, you want the virtual object to be like uh, rock steady. But so, so that's the disconnect that we get, uh, that we used to get with when, when I tried to implement it using these suite of sensors, wherein like it would work, but then there would be a drift in the inter inertial measurement unit so you need to correct for it. And to address that, we have a, a different approach for AR that is using images. Now, how do we use images to detect where the phone is in space? Uh, let's look at this picture. And um, imagine you have an image. If you look at that image, uh, let's just place that image on a table and let's look at that image at different, uh, from different uh, angles. So as you can see, like if you know how the image would look, how the actual uh, photograph of that object is, depending on where you're located uh, um, around that object, the way that object appears to you would be different. For instance, if if you keep that uh, uh, if you keep that sheet of paper very close to you, you'd see it to be really big, and as you move it farther, it appears to be small. And then, depending on where which other locations you're positioned, you'd see it in different perspectives. And by if we know exactly what the original picture is, and by find and by detecting like what the camera actually sees we can sort of back calculate where the camera is actually located, in this case, the phone. Putting these pieces together, we have uh, an image-based augmented reality or a, a marker. It's called a marker because uh, in, in the example that you see on the right, you have the page, or in this case, the image. That image acts like an anchor for the virtual object. And uh, and by you by continuously detecting and tracking this image, we are able to overlay it on the top and create an AR experience. Now, this this was actually one of the uh, this was my main project during my summer internship at NCAR, and this also my introduction to NCAR and how I got interested in the work that I was doing. I'm doing currently at NCAR. So the example that you see here is of an app called Meteo AR. 
And Meteo AR is an AR application that we use for education and outreach. We basically have a bunch of pages, we call them the science sheets, that have information about different science topics related to the work that NCAR does, along with the marker image. And when users use our application and view this page uh, through their phone, they're able to see an animation and a 3D object corresponding to the data set pop up on the top. So this was a like neat way to get um, basically people excited about what we are doing and sort of keeping them engaged and giving them a more interactive uh, view into like what we do at NCAR. So those were the visual aspects of AR and uh, basically how we've started exploring AR and you know we, we started like noticing the fun stuff that are happening with AR. However, uh, AR is really a much smaller concept. Like it's related to a much uh, a bigger concept called spatial computing. And that's something that we'll get into next. So uh, interestingly, spatial computing is a term that was uh, coined by like Simon Greenwald in his master's thesis in 2003. And according to like what was given, the definition is that spatial computing is a human interaction with the machine in which the machine retains and manipulates reference to real world objects and spaces. So let's translate that. So when you look at traditional computing, you have a computer, which is a device, and uh, the computer would have data and some logic and that makes the computer work. And you interact with the computer using uh, your monitor, which is your primary display device and your keyboard and the mouse. So with spatial computing, you add spatial awareness to the mix of data. So now the computers know what is in their surroundings. So with this capability, instead of uh, confining to the two dimensional screen with traditional computing, with spatial computing, now you can expand it into the room and the surroundings around you. So what that means is that uh, things like the desk that you see on the corner or the table, the bed, the walls, essentially the physical surroundings becomes a part of the interface. Now this has interesting applications as uh, in, in the accessible technology world. So as a part of our education and outreach st stuff that we do, like we maintain to, uh, we, we have a visitor center at the Mesa lab. So it's like a small scale museum that we use to educate people about the weather, climate impact, and basically the science that happens at NCA. So imagine a space like that. Now with spatial computing, we can make, we can create uh, an interaction in which the entire world, the entire building becomes a part of the inter in, uh, a part of the interaction. So we can do cool things like we can make the posters and the building talk to the person, uh, give additional instructions, which could have fascinating applications in the term. Uh, for people who are blind or vision impaired. And like th now this is something that we initially like had an idea and um, like to be honest, like I was like blissfully unaware of the accessibility implications of different stuff. But uh, the thing is like, I was able to see the, I was able to witness the inequities that happened because of uh, lack of access primarily through the experience of, of my wife who's blind. So uh, we did the next thing possible where uh, we put together a small scrummy prototype to see if it was working and seems to have a lot of potential. And uh, that's when like one thing led to another and we collaborated with another group at uh, Sizzle, like the Sizzle Code and uh, the Smithsonian's National Museum of African-American History and Culture. And the goal of this project was to create one such uh, augmented reality application uh, whose details I'll get into uh, momentarily. So in order to create an experience like the one that I've shown earlier, like what are some of the building blocks of it? So the first step of it is to create a virtual copy of the real world. So in, in this case, imagine you have a, <clears throat> a museum or an exhibit space. The first step is to create an exact virtual copy of this real world. Once we create a virtual copy, 
we need to do something called localization. And localization is a term from robotics. It basically uh, refers to the process that robots use to basically find out where they are in a space. For instance, if you give a map to a robot and uh, ask it to determine like where it is on that map, it needs to figure out, it needs to look outside into the surroundings and compare mm -hmm. it with the map and try to figure out where it is in the, on the map. In this case, the localization, the robot that I'm talking about is the phone that people are using. So once we have the localization handy, then we can go to the next step that is augmentation, wherein like we add different virtual content in the real world. And it can have other applications such as navigation, wherein like uh, it can be used as an indoor navigation device because like AR compared to some of the existing technologies, with AR, you can get really high uh, resolution. So let's go into each of these processes and how we implemented that. So in order to create a virtual copy, we really need two pieces of information. The first one is image detection and tracking, and the second one is something called BIO. So image detection and tracking. Now, this is similar to what I've shown earlier with the Meteor AR app in which we had these science pages. So essentially how, uh, going a little bit into the details, like how image detection tracking really works is, you first have a bunch of images and we extract certain features from those images. So these features are, it could be like changes in the texture or like it could be angles. It could be a, places that have a different contrast. Basically these unique features that are represented as yellow dots. And these images are abstracted into these bunch of, these things with bunch of yellow dots. So once we create a image library, we can then create a, an AR app in which uh, uh, when we run these image detection tracking algorithms, basically what the phone searches for is these yellow dots in the space. So it tries to create these yellow dots um, to in like whatever it sees and tries to detect where these things are in the space. And once it detects, it's all a matter of tag tracking it. The good thing is over the past couple of years, we have a lot of uh, libraries available that allow you to do this process. It, it sort of simplifies the process. So you don't have to go in and write a computer vision code to like do these things uh, manually. And the thing on the top, like those are all the libraries that are available for us to do. So now this is how we do it for Meteor AR, where we have these science pages. Now expanding it, those images need not be something that's movable. So we could make the app detect something that is more concrete, that is something fixed in space, like this wallpaper in the museum of I.M. Pei and Walter Roberts. So what this allows us to do is that now we have a reference to the real world that the image knows sorry, that the phone knows. Uh, and of course, image detection has its limitations, like similar to what Meteor AI has, like the tracking is always relative to the image. So like as long as the image is in view, the phone can sort of determine where it is in rel relative to the image. But once the image goes out of view, it, it needs to do something else. This technique alone does not allow the phone determine where it is in space. And the second uh, technology is visual inertial odometry. So VIO is something like relatively new that came out, uh, that became popular, that became widely available in the last, I would say like five years. So with VIO, it uses a hybrid approach in which we use something similar to the image detection and tracking. But in addition, like if you remember the first approach where we use gyroscopes and the IMU, it uses uh, the IMU data along with the camera data to sort of track the device post. So the way that does that is, um, I'll just call it the features or let's call them the yellow dots. So as for a, an, a phone that is running this VIO would generate this yellow dots in the environment. And by tracking these yellow dots uh, between frames, it's able to determine how it's moving relative to those yellow dots. 
which is great. So uh, the images that you see over here, like the first one is a image of my apartment, thanks COVID. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we had to like work from home. So you'll see a lot of pictures of my apartment. And uh, so, yeah, so that's the photograph. That's what we would see. And the image on the bottom is basically what a phone would see. Like I, I call it the matrix view in which it has all these yellow dots which correspond to different features. So this can be used to for the phone to determine how it's moving. There's only one problem with this approach. Uh, there are a couple of limitations of this approach. Firstly, like tracking is always relative to initial position. So for instance, with this approach alone, the phone doesn't know what it's seeing. So if you look at the image on the right where I'm taking the phone and scanning the couch, the phone doesn't know that it's a couch in the first place. It just knows that there are a bunch of points and it knows how it's moving relative to the initial position, but it doesn't know where it is in three-dimensional space. And the other limitation is data volume. So if you were to use this alone, uh, imagine this phone is generating these yellow dots everywhere. Now expand it to a space like NCAR and now take it a step further. Now expand it to a place like the Smithsonian, uh, let's take Namak, like in National Museum of African-American History and Culture where those pages spaces are quite huge. So like just stay in one exhibit and like it would fill up your phone's memory if you were to use this approach alone. So we'll see how we can use these two things together to find to uh, make the map. But just using these two pieces independently of one another, we can generate a map of the real world. So that's the first piece of the puzzle that I've mentioned earlier. And this video shows that example of us mapping and scan, scanning and creating a virtual map, a scaled virtual map of the uh, of the visitor center at NCAR. You can see all the yellow dots as well as the images that we train the uh, phone to detect in its surroundings and as well as like try to keep a track of like where those images are located. And um, for folks who in the audience, like if you've been to NCAR and if you've been to the museum, like you might be able to recognize some of the features like the main staircase and the big mural on the wall of the sun. So that's the first, uh, that's the first part. That's to create the virtual copy of the world. The second step is localization. And this is the place where like we sort of uh, bring those two pieces of technology together. So in this piece, uh, let's see how we put that together. So the first step is the image detection and tracking where uh, we first create a reference of all the images that are placed uh, that are present in the museum. We create an image library and run image detection and tracking. So that should tell the phone which image is detected and track it if needed. Now, because we already we have already created a fecal facility map, that map has information on uh, not just which image, but we also know where that image is located. And that provides, uh, that gives a sense of reference to the phone and the phone knows where it is in the, on, in the building. So yeah, combining the location information with the images information, we can sort of know where you're located. And that's where VIO comes in. Now, in, instead of storing and creating a map, what we do is we use uh, VIO just to track between the images. And it's something that runs in the background. And the, both these systems, they sort of hand off control to one another, depending on like where the phone is located. I'm sorry, uh, depending on what the phone is doing. So if an image is in view, it uses the image to just make sure that it's it is where it is where it's supposed to be or where it thinks it is the phone and whenever when there's no image in view it just uses vio to figure out like how it's moving relative to the previous state and that's basically the localization and uh, of course now we have a map and we have a phone that is localized in world so we can combine these two things together and uh, have a navigation application where like we can add pathfinding algorithms to this faculty map, facility map and uh, have navigation capabilities. And 
this is like those two pieces trying to work together. And yeah, this is the spot where like it tries to detect and tries to localize itself. And what you're seeing is basically the phone creating the yellow dots. And in this step, like I'm basically saving that entire map just to debug and try to understand what that phone is doing. And the white line shows like how, where that uh, phone thinks it's going in space. And the inset image on the right shows uh, basically the phone, like what the user would be seeing. And it goes on for a while and So it, it, it keeps detecting the images and if there's no correction involved, like it doesn't do anything. And then I climb up the stairs and come back to my starting position. So at this stage, we only have, uh, we have those two pieces implemented and it is a work in progress. So the next step is the augmentation, the navigation components that come together to put in. And um, of course, like we have a long way to go, but this is, this is basically uh, the core part of it is implemented. So now uh, this work has potential other applications too. So at this point, the map that you have seen, it's it's basically a much simpler version of a map. So you only have a few images in it, and of course, uh, you have the floor map. You could, but we could add like auxiliary sensor data to it. So um, imagine like adding data from the real world sensors that sort of like direct people to places where there are less crowded. Or uh, imagine a situation where like, if you have a map, like trying to find a different, uh, so, so because we have this three dimensional map of the world, we can run some like computer simulations, like uh, let's say that's a gas leak or something. We could use that to redirect people to places where it's safer or basically redirect people to uh, places where uh, it's less crowded. And these are all some of the ideas that we've discussed with like our, um, these are some of the ideas that our collaborators have brought up, like including like Raven if, and hi Raven if you're in the audience and uh, some of the other folks at NCAR. And we can extend it further. Like for instance, um, take a map of this world now, so you have a phone that knows where it is in that three-dimensional space. We can attach digital repositories to it. For instance, uh, take a digital repository such as uh, like any museum, there's only a small fraction of their uh, stuff that is on the floor. There's a lot of digital footprint that it could be articles or scanned images or scanned information related to different objects. We could use that information along with this application to sort of anchor them both in space uh, in, in place. So we can bring those two things together. So uh, what we can do is like ask, for instance, if someone were to walk near an exhibit related to the climate, the phone can detect and bring in some, some of the other content that we have that's not present on the floor. And of course we can also have real time updates from sensors. So really this is going into a concept called digital twin. Like basically what, what we try to do with the virtual model is like a zeroth level digital twin where we only have that space mapped out. But if you start adding the systems and um, some of the other um, systems ability to uh, simulate the environment in, inside it, uh, it, it can really have other applications where uh, it really gives us control over like what's happening in the building and how we can use this information to better serve people around. Um, and th that's the part with spatial computing. So like the previous two, like, uh, and to give you a little bit of a map. So, we, so we've seen science and visualizations along with AR and how those pieces put together to inform uh, data visualizations. And we've seen how spatial computing could be used as a navigation and wayfinding device. And this brings us to the third component of, uh, which is like accessibility of data visualizations. So uh, over here, you see an image of a map with, a, it's basically a dashboard of the COVID cases and basically some public health information. And over the last two years, we've seen a lot of examples where uh, this information was available to uh, 
this information was primarily was the primary means by which uh, the impacts of COVID-19 and basically a real pulse of what's happening around was distributed to the people. However, like a recent study in 2021, and in fact, not just this study, like some of the other studies have found out that this predominant reliance on visual encoding has created accessibility barriers for people who are blind or vision impaired. So we clearly have an issue with data visualizations. Now, as a technology person, like I am tempted to go ahead and find a technical solution to like any problem that I come across. However, like over like over a period of time, like I began like understanding that, especially when you're designing systems for for people who do not have the same experiences as uh, we have, we need to take a more cautious approach especially because of that mismatch and the kind of experience that one might be having. So uh, so with the thing about data visualizations, like the approach that we took was uh, the, the, the first question that we were trying to answer is like, even try to find what the problem is. So we need to find out like, what do we need to do to address this issue? What the problem is? And secondly, when you look at the solution, like what kind of solution do we need? And this is where like I had to put in my like interdisciplinary hat. And uh, th there is a related field called disability studies. And disability studies is a field that's focused on the study of disability through social, cultural, and political perspectives. So like over many years, like disability studies has played a crucial role in trying to define the rhetoric, trying to define the language that people use, as well as, uh, uh, explain the uh, ways in which uh, researchers and others can understand disability. So in the field of disability studies, like uh, let's go to the first question. So how do we find out like what the problem is? So for that in disability studies, we have something called a model. A model is basically a framework of, or it's an approach that one could use to basically define like how we are trying to understand disability. So there are two main models over here. So one is called the medical model and the other one is social model. So with like if for, for a researcher or someone who's using a medical model, for them, they, they approach disability as something that's caused by an underlying medical condition. And so consequently, the solutions that they would propose would be related to the medical condition or like trying to fix in quotes the disability. And when you look at the social model, so people following the social model would see disability as something that's caused by environmental factors. So to give you an example, so if you have someone with a in a wheelchair in front of stairs, someone following a medical model would go to fix the disability. So it would they would either look to find better prosthetics or find a better wheelchair, a wheelchair that can maybe climb stairs. And this is an example from like a paper by Lundgaard et al in 2019. And for someone who's following a social model, their solutions are outwards. So what they would say is like, when you have someone with a wheelchair, like in front of stairs, what we need is really a ramp and not a better wheelchair or something that needs to be done to the wheelchair or something that the person with the disability has to uh, do. So with this, we uh, I have a poll over here. So when you look at uh, connecting it back to what we are trying to do. So with data visualizations, and if you're looking at accessible data visualizations and you're, you're trying to understand which model we need to follow, which model do you think is a better fit for our use? And there you go. Let's give it a few more seconds. Okay. So th that's interesting. So, cause we need both of them in a way and that makes sense because uh, like some of the literature, when you look at the literature, what it shows is that uh, when you look at the medical model of disability, 
most of it is focused inwards. So in fact, if you look at any accessible technology related uh, literature, most of the approach that they take is the medical model, mainly because it defines exactly like what the limitation is and you're trying to limit, uh, you are trying to address that limitation. However, like medical model is heavily criticized mainly because uh, it, uh, oftentimes it takes like a narrow view of what a disability is and uh, that is something that people don't appreciate. And the other thing with social model is that uh, the most of the solutions that are addressed are more outwards focused. So, uh, so most of their uh, solutions would be directed towards self-advocacy, peer support, or anything that we can do to the environment to basically uh, address the disability. So, so, and both these models could be used. So for instance, the medical model can be used uh, while designing assistive technology to find, get technical considerations. And the social models can be used to get social considerations. And it's important to get both because especially with the social considerations, uh, historically, it's it's always been about the person with the disability, like what they can do, what can we do to fix that disability. And oftentimes we lose track of the person. And um, so social considerations has uh, plays a major role in trying to understand like what, what we need to solve. But no matter what, like it is imperative to work with people with disabilities while access while developing accessible technologies. Again, this is important. Like if you're a researcher, or like, like since I'm a researcher who is in this case not blind, when I try to tackle a solution, it is an ocular-centric approach. So here I have a picture of a Braille Rubik's cube and a Rubik's cube that has a tactile markers for different colors. And um, Think about why a Braille Rubik's Cube is not a great design. And personally, like this is something that uh, I, it was like an aha light bulb moment for it when like I was trying to like test this application with my wife with the previous, uh, like the navigation application. For instance, over here, I used an, I devised an interface that was right-handed because I knew my wife was right-handed and uh, I thought it'll be easier for her to use it that way. But it turns out like since she's a white cane user, she uses her right hand to use right hand to use the white cane. So in fact, like she would have preferred a left-handed interface. And taking it a step further, ideally there should be an option to make it both right-handed and left-handed to uh, accommodate all types of people. And taking it even a step further, like do you even need to have a user interface? Like can it be voice activated or something so that we do not, people don't even need hands to operate it. So those are the kinds of approaches that we can find out by following this participatory design method. And now moving forward to like what kind of solutions we need. Now over here, we have two options. So we have something called a universal design in which the solution that we are trying to find, we design a solution that will reach as many people as possible. The second approach is inclusive design in which we might not design a single solution. It could be a suite of solutions that are meant to meet as many user needs as possible. Now, again, both of them have merits in a way because universal design is a concept that was introduced in architecture early on. And uh, it makes sense in physical buildings because you cannot, you need to have that one physical space that need to accommodate as many people as possible. So the goal is to make a solution that can satisfy as many people as possible. But with digital interfaces and technology, we do have an advantage because now we are no longer constrained by that physical space. So we can look at solutions that are outwards wherein uh, we can design a solution that ha that can meet like uh, that can meet specific needs of people and people would just pick the solution that works best for them so following the and um, and uh, uh, like this inclusive design principles were like uh, like i first came across inclusive design principles through cat homes work and uh, she identifies these three principles that one has to implement in order to like approach a problem through an inclusive design lens. The first step is to identify exclusion. 
So in our case, we need to identify who we are excluding with data visualizations. So we have that part figured out. So that would be like someone who is blind or vision impaired. And the second one is learning from diversity. The second, uh, for the second step, we need to reach out to people who are blind and vision impaired, who, who have been excluded with data visualizations and understand their experiences and perspective. And the last one is uh, basically solve for those, uh, those specific needs and try to find a solution and extend that solution so that it meets uh, users who have other situational based uh, needs. And based on that, we designed the research study to examine the accessibility barriers of uh, data visualizations. The first step was uh, we reached out to around like seven professionals in geosciences who are blind. And we basically conducted an interview uh, it was an in-depth interview with examining their experiences, the tools, techniques, everything that they use. And um, the way we approach this is we did a thematic analysis on it. So what that means is like we take the interview, create a transcript. We try to find common themes between different interviews and we club those themes together and try to uh, create a story and understand like, yeah, what's the common theme across all, like all these uh, individuals. So that was the first step. And the second step was case study. So we were we picked the Arctic sea ice representation and I'll go into the details as to like what that is and uh, how we approach uh, designing an alternate visual representation for it or not non-visual representation for sea ice. So firstly, with the tools and techniques, uh, one thing that surprised us or or rather like we shouldn't be surprised is that there's no one approach that people have been using like they use a variety of solutions um, to access the information that is present the first thing is visual not all people who are blind uh, uh, are like totally blind so there are people with partial vision so they would use uh, like they they've stated that they use magnifiers a lot and auditory. So we have something called sonification. And this is a project that was done by a couple of our scientists at NCAR. Wherein if you look at traditional data visualizations, you have a, a map and the data is encoded. So data is basically numbers and those numbers are encoded with color. And the, so the color can tell you um, where different patterns are. So with sonification, instead of color, we use um, uh, sound. So each of these colors imagine like they are represented by different uh, tone and by changes in the tone, we can listen to what the data is doing. It works really good for uh, things like a line chart, like the chart that you see below. It's a little challenging to do in a two dimensional um, um, uh, data set like a map. Of course you have the tactile stuff like the, over here we have a braille embossed graph and uh, even something called the braille display. So in fact, many of our participants mentioned that given the complexity of some of the data sets, they just go back to an Excel sheet, lay out all the numbers, try to narrow down where the interesting features are and go through the numbers line by line through a braille uh, keyboard. So it, it basically translates the line by line, whatever you see on the Excel sheet onto that braille line that you see at the bottom. And lastly, like they often use sighted assistance too. So some of their colleagues or people could uh, give them an overview of what's interesting. And um, that, that can help them narrow down on to like, if there's a specific area in the visualization that they're interested, they could delve deeper onto that. So this brings us to the other two uh, findings, which is, uh, so what are some of the technical and social considerations that we need to figure out when we are trying to address accessibility barriers? So uh, of course I've distilled them to just the key findings. So the first one is that there's no one approach that is preferred. It, it, and this again is not a surprise because disability is a spectrum. So even if you take two people who are blind, their experiences might be different based on the kind of disability that they have. So if you create one approach that works for everybody like that. So if you try to create an approach that works for everybody, like we might end up creating an approach that works for nobody. And the other thing is that like there are two aspects to data visualizations. We can use data visualizations, like at least in our lab, like we use data visualizations for two purposes. 
So the first one is a, a scientist could use data visualizations to explore what is there in the data. So that's called like exploratory data visualization, which is good for finding, uh, an, as the name suggests, exploring what's in the data. And the second one is um, uh, explanatory data visualizations. So those are data visualizations that we use to, uh, as the name suggests, explain what's in the data visualization. It often comes after the exploratory phase where uh, we create a visual of uh, something that we want to communicate and we tr try to tell a story with that visual. So what, what we found out was that there are very few tools available for research and most of the limitations currently come from uh, the following. So uh, if you take the existing techniques, like they lack the resolution that is needed to that is needed to uh, interpret data related to research. And uh, like some of the techniques like 3D printing and tactile graphics, they did mention that they were very memorable and those are some of the most memorable uh, representations of data that they've seen, but they haven't come across a, a, a tactile solution that is um, that can be used in research because it's hard to like create you can't create a 3D print for like every time you're exploring a data set. So that's just not, that's very impractical. The second thing was with production time. So like things like 3D printing take time. So for instance, if you if you want to 3D print a data set, it can take a whole night, a day, and depending on the complexity, it can take a couple of days. And that is not very ideal for research. For outreach, yes. Like if you want to just tell a story, you can you can take your time, create a visualization, I'm sorry, create a tactile representation that you can use repeatedly in your um, outreach event. And some of the other limitations are like cost of production and like lack of techniques that uh, give them autonomous capability to explore data sets. So these are the technical considerations and these are the opportunities for where technology could potentially help. But again, caveat, like we have to work with the people with disabilities in a participatory design approach to make sure that we are not uh, designing something that's utterly unusable or we design something like totally discounting the experiences of someone with a disability. Moving to the social considerations. Now, these are something that the society or the community can do to make visualizations more uh, accessible. The first step thing is alternate text. So uh, many of my study participants, they use screen reader. So screen reader is the software that pretty much reads out the content or information that is present on the screen. And uh, typically when they visit a web page and there are images in the web page, there are options in which you can add uh, something called an alternate text to those images. So if you are a visual person, if you're seeing a web page, you, you might not, you will not see the alt text, but a screen reader user or a screen reader will catch the alt text and it'll read out what the image is doing. And many people actually prefer alt text, but they've pointed out that like alt text is missing from many scientific publications. And uh, most of the publications that happen in journal and basically in academia. And so for things like these, we already have a screen reader that can catch and read alt text. So like really the focus is on like, oh, what can all of us as a community do? One thing is like to add alt text and it can be something simple. And uh, much simpler than that, like many people have asked access to underlying data. This comes back to the no approach that works for everybody. So sometimes uh, like many of these scientists, like they have their own code and they have their own techniques that they use to uh, make sense of data. But for that, you need a data. So, so basically, uh, if we are able to provide an underlying data, if you can attach the data to the visualization that is published in research, that could be something very simple, but that can go a long ways. And um, we don't need to develop a completely new technology to make it happen. So together, this sort of gives us an idea of like where we can approach and what kind of techniques we can uh, use to address some of these limitations. So the next part of the uh, thing was to create a CIS prototype. So CIS is uh, like the layer of the ocean that's frozen in the Northern hemisphere. And uh, traditionally we used uh, visualizations like the one that you've seen in which um, 
what you see is the northern view of you, you you're seeing an animation of the northern hemisphere and uh the white thing in the center is basically the sea ice shrinking and expanding over the uh over the course of an year so sea ice has implications because that that's one of the major uh victims of climate change where um like because of the global warming we have sea ice that is shrinking as in like there, there is this annual cycle, but if you look at the September sea ice values, they, they are shrinking over time. And that can have major implications to the Arctic ecosystem. So, so the video is one way to visualize it. And the other way to do it is with uh, things like the graph, wherein you can see the, the graph at the bottom, the blue line shows how the sea ice extent is changing. And you can see how like around 2030 to 2040, the sea ice actually, we will have an Arctic sea ice, uh, like ice free Arctic in September. So we have sonification that I've showed earlier and uh, graphs like this could be made tactile. In this case, uh, what we tried to do is we took the sea ice data that you see and we laser cut those sea ice pieces. And the basic goal is, uh, it's one thing to see a graph in which it shows a number going to zero, but it's totally another thing to actually see a piece of sea ice in your hand and then uh, trying to um, understand, like, and basically trying to understand like how that piece gets smaller and disappears. It just tries to, I think it, we can get that point across uh, uh, more viscerally. And uh, again, like this was the feedback of the participants that we tested uh, with Colorado Center for the Blind, wherein we showed them the CIs, we tell, tell them the story and try them, uh, ask them to interpret the data. And uh, when, they, when they compared the CIs piece from 1980 and uh, they overlay the 2040 CIs, it, it really gets the point across. And um, we can then go into like explaining why climate change is in, uh, crucial and why we need to have methods to address or mitigate it. Now, again, uh, the basic goal is uh, of this project is, so we have a visual of the CIs representation, like the video that you've seen. Following the inclusive design principles, our approach is to add these additional uh, um, supplements to CIs. So for instance, we can have these prints that people could use to 3D print or laser cut to you know, basically uh, understand the story. Now I understand that not everyone has a 3D printer, not everyone has a laser cutter, and that's where maker spaces can come in handy. And uh, for this particular project, we've used the Boulder Public Library's maker space and a huge shout out to them. Like they really helped us uh, like navigate these machines and like trying to get those printouts, um, try to get those prints out. So uh, if you are someone interested in 3D printing or laser cutting or things like that, look out for maker spaces. These are community workshops that anyone can go in and like work on different projects. So with that, uh, wrapping up all these topics. So we've seen, we, uh, so I've started with an application of augmented reality that have got nothing to do with accessibility. And we've seen how like accessibility AR could be made accessible if we step a little away from um, seeing AR or augmented reality as a predominantly visual means of augmenting information. Moving on, uh, we've looked at how, uh, like as a technologist, we need to take a step back and try to understand the experiences of people who are disabled before like designing solutions that could address a specific issue. Putting these two, uh, all these things together, like some of the lessons that I learned in this journey was uh, the quest for inclusive future is a process. Like it's not, uh, it, it's not to say that yeah we we have this tactile representation of CIs and uh, the problem is done. So we don't know how many more uh, applications are out there. And secondly, like it's, yeah, as I said, like it's important to understand the lived experiences of people with disabilities include people with disabilities at every stage. And that's something that we saw with the tactile representation, the data visualizations project, where like they had some of the insights that like, for us, like it, it's something that we, it just doesn't occur. Like when, uh, as someone who was cited, like that's a perspective that 
I, I, I couldn't imagine that I would have. And uh, la, the next thing is like drawing from interdisciplinary work. So we have a lot of <clears throat> disciplines and like all these disciplines are progressing at a rapid space, uh, pace. And the advantage of interdisciplinary work is that we can have, like if, if you're looking for a solution for a problem, like that solution could be there in some other discipline. So being able to draw things from interdisciplinary work can really expand our horizon. And lastly, like technology can be a great enabler, but uh, it has to be considered in tandem with human factors. And acknowledgements, sincere thanks to all our collaborators who taught us about disability studies, who taught us about like museums, who taught us about the science happening, who helped us with visualizations uh, and handling data, uh, as well as uh, folks from Boulder Public Library who helped us manufacture some of these prototypes or who helped us use the machines to do it. And lastly, like all the funding agencies without whom like this work wouldn't have been possible. With that, uh, I thank you all and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Nihant, for that wonderful talk. And you covered a lot. I saw, I see that you and your team have done a lot in terms of augmented reality in VR and um, that hailstone with the doggy is pretty neat. Um, I did play Pokemon Go or the, the Pokemon uh, app that you had shared and it's pretty neat. And I do have this cube that also is um, kind of what you talked about and it's pretty fun. Um, so we can, I think the audience can definitely check out uh, these, um, the Medio AR applications and everything that you talked about on our website. Um, and we do have a few questions from our audience with Eric Levine's question. Um, can you please discuss the software you use for this work and the hardware computer requirements? Sure. So uh, again, like uh, at NCAR, like most of our focus has been like, we wanted to create technology that people could readily access. And when you look at augmented things like augmented reality, you can go really high end, like you can get an AR glasses and use it, or you can use these low end devices like mobile phones. So if you just wanna get started, the minimum requirements would be, <clears throat> honestly, like any run of the mill, like laptop would work for augmented reality application. The software requirements, uh, so I use game engines for it, interestingly. So apparently game engines have applications uh, beyond video games. They can be used for data visualizations as well. So I use Unity in particular, but I assume you could use Unreal as well. And that's another game engine. Hardware compute requirements. Uh, honestly, like any, ex uh, if you take an existing, like uh, any laptop with like the basic RAM and those, uh, like the stuff that you have currently, like take the one with the minimum requirements, you should be able to put together an AR application with it because like a lot of AR also depends on the data that uh, that we use. So, uh, so really it depends, like you can put an augmented reality application with as little requirements, uh, like as little data as you want or as more. That's often to hear that there's already um, technology out there that you can use. Um, so thank you for that question and for the response. And then another question that we have is in VIO, what does it mean when there's a denser cluster of yellow dots versus just a few sporadic yellow dots? And I did notice this when you were showing the, the couch, the pillows were pretty bright and then mm -hmm. the rest of it was a little bit less. Yeah, and, and that's because uh, the pillow has a design on it and the design and the textures create more uh, dots. And so it, it becomes easier for the phone to see. And when I'm pointing at a wall, the wall doesn't have any texture. That's where the phone's not able to detect any features. And when it comes to the inner workings of like how it works, that, that's something I, I believe like it's a proprietary secret of Apple. <laughs> So, but, uh, but in general, that's the thing. More texture, you would see more dots and you need it, it's good. Less texture, less, less dots. 
I didn't even think about the texture of objects. So thank you for that clarification. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about what do you hope to create at NCAR in the future? Yeah, so we really have seen two uh, potential future directions. Um, so there's that application that we are um, collaborating with Smithsonian's NAMARC, in which we, we, we want to literally like the ideal like goal would be to create a digital twin of the uh, exhibit space so that like we can not only use it as an accessibility technology, but uh, it can have like a universal applications to it. So that's one approach. And uh, in fact, using that same approach, uh, like one thing that I haven't discussed is potentially like using a phone or AR experience combined with sonification to figure out if we can make three-dimensional data sets accessible. So that's one approach and really with, with these data visualizations and accessibility project, uh, it, it's a very underexplored area in uh, visualization research. So there's a lot of uh, work that can be done on that front to both work on the process as well as the technology to improve the accessibility. And it sounds like you're have you're doing some collaborations external with NCAR, so um, external yes. to NCAR. So that's also great to hear. Um, and then can you explain what it means to do interdisciplinary work? Yeah, so uh, interdisciplinary is basically any work that draws from multiple disciplines. So for instance, uh, like I was first introduced to the idea, like I have my degree in mechanical engineering, but while I was working with, um, with LIDARs, like I had to learn the um, optics as to how like LIDARs work, like I had to have a basic understanding of how that how that happens. I need to know like um, computer vision concepts because like what a LIDAR sees is not exactly what we want. It doesn't really directly measure the wind field. You need to calculate it back. So, so basically interdisciplinary work is any work that goes across the disciplines. Great, thank you. And it's, it's cool that you can have a degree maybe that's not directly AR, VR, but you can apply the skills that you learn from your degree into this field. And it sounds like you had also done an internship um, to be exposed to this type of work. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. And then um, can you help us understand, is the metaverse the same thing as a digital as digital twins? They're related, but they're not exactly the same. Like Metaverse is more, uh, it's, I know Facebook is currently working, but Meta is currently working on that. So with Metaverse, uh, the whole goal is to have that virtual experience. So you create this uh, three-dimensional world and uh, you use virtual reality that you, I mean, we can, like all of us can have virtual goggles and like transport into that virtual space. So Metaverse is more uh, about VR and with Digital Twin, it's a much broader concept. It's related to Metaverse. So in fact, the Digital Twin that I've mentioned can be used as Metaverse, but the scope of Digital Twins is a lot broader than just visual or just a space to work in. Thank you. Um, and thank you, John, for your comment that this was a fascinating talk and you learned a lot. So we're definitely glad to hear that. Um, and Nihans, I wonder if you can tell us, um, you know, you kind of mentioned your career path, mentioned you had an internship. For any student who's interested in kind of going into this field, but they might not know how or what that process would be, can you share a little bit about your um, recommendations on what they should study um, to pursue this type of career path? So, uh... Again, like as I've said, like when I started my work, uh, like if I knew exactly what I had to do to be where I am, <laughs> that would have been a lot simpler. So uh, I would say like, based on my personal experience, it might be different for people who are like, uh, who have a different experience than I do. I would say like, just start where you are. And uh, if you're interested in, like if, if you're someone who's absolutely new to coding, I would look into uh, like learning some programming language. And 
Uh, I would say you can even start with game engines. Like it has a very gamified, like fun way of learning, um, seeing the results of like what we can do with coding. So I, I would say definitely learn programming. That's going to that's going to be applied in any any like even if you like learn programming and decide that this is not the part that you want to take, I'm pretty sure you can use that elsewhere. So I would definitely start with learning how to code. Awesome, and you did mention interdisciplinary work. So even if yes. they weren't doing the coding, there might be other opportunities to collaborate in this type of work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, in fact, um, yeah, to clarify, like, if you want to do the technology stuff, yeah, you can. But if you want to collaborate, like, maybe, like, we can meet somewhere in the middle. Like, you can, like, this person, you can bring in, like, your expertise, and like, we can collaborate. Awesome. Yeah, because I know art is always the other thing that's like, how can we get art into the part of STEM and definitely needs a lot of creativity to do some of the work yeah. that we do. Um, it doesn't look like we have any other questions, um, but we will have this recording up on our website and we're always happy to connect with the scientists if any other questions come up definitely check out the website, um, check out some of the features for the Medio AR application. And once the NCAR Mesa Lab opens up again and the technologies are kind of set, then we'll be able to, to use the applications that Nihant mentioned today. Um, but with that, I just wanna say thank you so much Nihant for such a great talk and sharing all the work that you and your team are doing at NCAR. Um, and thank you for your talk. And then we'll see everybody else at our next event. And thank you, Dan, Aliyah, Brett, and Paul. And we hope you have a good evening. Um, and another comment was just, you know, very interesting talk. Learned a lot. Inclusion is a very important subject. So thank you so much.